Okay. Testing, testing. Live stream. Good. Okay. Um, so as was pointed out to me, and it's something that happens um, more often than I'd like, but it's just because Blackboard sometimes runs really slow. Uh, sometimes when I'm transferring grades over from my uh, role book into the um, into Blackboard, and I'm trying to do it relatively quickly because I'm usually tired and ready to go to bed by the time I'm doing that part. Um, it will only catch like one of the numbers and then just put it in there. So you'll have like a single digit grade, which isn't good. <laughs> um, yeah, a three, or, or in the case of today, an eight. Um, and that's probably wrong, unless you did really bad. Um, yeah, had someone with like a one, it's like, no, you didn't get a one, you got like a 91. That's a big difference. Um, so if you have like a grade like that, let me know. That's probably concerning for you. That said, if you do have like a single digit grade in Blackboard, um, it's not going to actually affect you because I use all your grades um, from my role book. Blackboard is just for you to look at. Um, now, that said, the grades that I use for my online class, that's why I'm telling you online folks, um, are largely recorded on Blackboard. So if you see any weird discrepancies like that, let me know and I'll go back and look at the, the recorded tests and stuff. Um, so telling you guys that now, please actually watch the videos. Uh, those numbers have been going down. Um, so yeah, but especially for, for you folks here, <laughs> um, don't freak out, uh, I promise. It's that the, the Blackboard stuff is largely for you to look at. And also one more thing for Blackboard, which I have just gotten emails about. Um, Blackboard's awful. The like total grade or whatever that column is, don't ignore that. That's got nothing to do with anything. That's a Blackboard feature that I really can't do anything about. That has nothing to do with the grade that I'm, that I'm gonna use. They just add all the grades together, which is like dumb. I don't know why you would do that. I mean, I guess it'd be like, well, you can add them together and then divide them by the totals. Like I can do that with the calculator. <laughs> Um, but also, like, I dropped the lowest grade anyway, so that one doesn't really help me. Um, so yeah, don't don't worry about don't worry about that column. That's Blackboard's column. And if you know anything about Blackboard by now, Blackboard's dumb and bad. Okay. Um, normally we go over the test, but since a couple people haven't taken it yet, um, we'll. Uh, We'll wait on that. Okay, so we are still in chapter eight, which we only really just started it last time. It's trying to get you. We probably got sprinklers in here. Uh, actually, I don't see a sprinkler system. Yeah, we might be screwed. I was saying we I don't I don't see sprinklers in here. <laughs> You'll be the first to know. All right. Um, any questions before we start? Oh, final paper. I know I told a couple people in here, but since everybody's here now, well, most of you, I don't know, we've got a few people not here today. Um, the default topic is choosing somebody from the American Revolution. <coughs> that can be, you know, anybody from the revolution. Um, 
obviously, if we're going to be doing like a major figure like a founding father, only tell me about what they did during the revolution because I don't want a biography on George Washington. Um, but that said, if you want to give me a more like esoteric uh, Wait, story, I've never heard that one. a more unusual story of one of these individuals' lives. I had someone talk about Ben Franklin last year, and I learned that he was like a member of the swimming club and set all these weird swimming records in his life and had invented like what would be considered modern day flippers but for his hands so he could like yeah he, he got into all sorts of shenanigans besides the things he did in France um and of course there's you know Abigail Adams and uh the various women in the revolution but also like you can write about stuff all the way up until the Civil War. There's the War of 1812 and um, all the stuff in between. So there's plenty of stuff you can write about. Uh, but the default is just people during the Revolution. And that's due December 5th, so you've got plenty of time. Okay. Um, so, uh, this is where we ended last time, uh, the new colleges, uh, the novels becoming popular, uh, Washington Irving, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, uh, Mason Parson Weems, the art of the time, actually let's just go ahead and go through. Washington Irving, uh, this is where's the, oh, Charles William Peel, Fortress of Washington, uh, and this is the one that we ended on, uh, Samuel Jennings painted the liberty displaying the arts and sciences, um, which we ended on and everybody was ready to leave, so I don't think we really got into that. Um, where do we have? Oh. Very talk. Do we talk about the Capitol? No. Where the heck are we? Okay. Uh, Sam Jennings offered a more radical perspective on the nation's character when he presented a liberty, liberty displaying the arts and sciences. Uh, many of the library's directors opposed slavery, and Jennings portrayed Lady Liberty offering a book to the, a group of attentive African Americans. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Yeah, so it doesn't really get the entire aspect of this painting, though, because as I said, um, you've got this this Phrygian cap, this thing that you wouldn't really learn about in this class, but since I also teach uh, European history and the French Revolution goes on and on about the Phrygian caps, um, and they're in all sorts of state seals, especially here on the East Coast, um, I feel like I should mention that to you guys. It's not going to be on any tests, but it's good to know because you're going to see them a lot. If you look at any kind of old colonial imagery um, or revolutionary era imagery, they're everywhere. All right. So despite that, There are still limits to quite how open and accepting uh, American culture could be. Uh, the writers and scientists in America would use Native Americans often as subjects of what they were doing. 
um, as we saw with the Boston Tea Party, those that were protesting economic and what they saw as uh, political tyranny would dress up as natives, uh, in part as disguises and also as sort of a, um, a symbol of freedom, I guess, which is a weird thing considering how badly the colonists slash settlers slash Americans later uh, oppressed the natives. We had riders in Hudson River Valley, the Whiskey Rebellion, squatters in Maine would disguise themselves as Native Americans for attacking landlords, again, partially to shift the blame uh, and partially as uh, a statement. Also, the Tammany societies uh, that were named after the Delaware Chief Tamman, Tamman, Tamman. Um, they promoted patriotism, republicanism. Again, they they revered to a certain extent the Native Americans while still like exterminating them. So there was this poem by Philip Freneau. Freneau? Yeah, good enough. Um, called Indian Burying Ground. It was about the lost heritage and near extinction of Native culture. Uh, let's see. Sentimental portrait that highlighted the lost heritage of a nearly extinct Native uh, culture in New England. Um, the theme of lost cultures and heroic, if still savage, Indians became even more pronounced in American poetry in the following decades. Now, obviously, these views of the Native Americans and, indeed, of African Americans were typically from the views of the white Americans because there wasn't much education opportunity for uh, Natives or Blacks. Um, some Native Americans could enroll in schools but only really as ministers so they could go back and try to convert their tribes. Obviously, African Americans, and especially in the South, were discouraged from any kind of education because uh, we, we, we don't want these people to realize, oh, hey, this whole slavery thing is uh, really not great, and we should be included in the decision-making of the country. Um, and in the best-case scenario, they were left out of governmental plans of organized uh, education. So like in the North, in say Massachusetts, um, where elementary education was free for everyone, that was for white children, uh, obviously. It was, didn't include the uh, free African, African Americans in the area. So for any kind of organized education, they had to work together. Um, oftentimes through what organizations they had, and that was in large part the uh, African Methodist Church. So in broad strokes, Native Americans were seen as being uncivilized, but able to be educated. They were, there's this big thing, and this comes uh, in greater degrees uh, next semester when we talk about American imperialism and the idea of the white man's burden uh, extending to Asia and the Pacific Islands of these like uncivilized natives that need uh, Western civilization to help them and they just don't understand yet. Um, whereas Africans were seen as simply being inferior and therefore justified slavery because, of course. So 
so there's uh, Philip Frenou. It's the only little image I could find for this. Hanging out with the, the various tribes. So there was this movement in the late 1780s um, that was basically, hey, so even in regions where slavery is illegal, it still sucks to be an African American in the United States. What if we just left? So we had the Newport African Union Society, which was a group in, that uh, want to, wanted to establish a uh, community for African American blacks in Africa. Um, basically, this is sort of the start of Sierra Leone. That doesn't really begin until Britain gets involved. Uh, with William Thornton here. Uh, he was a Quaker, inherited a sugar plantation, uh, and worked with the group in London to create this free black commonwealth. Uh, free, free African Society in Philadelphia disagreed with this. Whites called this colonization. Whites called it immigration, because, you know, colonization was such a good word, uh, especially for a group that were colonies that broke away from a mother country like 10 years ago, not even, 1780s. So we also had the American Colonization Society. Um, this was a largely white group, uh, southern slave owners, Northern merchants uh, wanted to carry civilization and Christianity to Africa by establishing this colony of free blacks. So their goal wasn't just having a place for um, the disenfranchised African Americans to go, um, but that through this co uh, this community, they'll be able to push. Western ideals into Africa because we haven't invented quinine yet so uh, white folk going too deep in Africa get murdered by malaria um, so with this they'd be able to, to push their own uh, jingoism into the, the heart of Africa so um, some free blacks in America did support this. Uh, others, largely in the North, saw it as coming, quote, more from prejudice than philanthropy. Uh, in other words, it, it eased racism by getting rid of an entire race. It's like, hey, we can't be racist against black people if there aren't any black people around. I mean, that's very like I'm trying to think of a, a state in like the northwest like Minnesota one of those really like there's 30,000 people in the entire state and 29,000 of them are white um, however none of this really bore fruit uh, because by the 1790s the production of cotton rapidly increased. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, and therefore the need for slave labor rapidly increased. So the slave owners of the South who had been considering the idea of, oh, well, we're sort of moving away from this need for slave labor so we can 
pretend like we were against it the whole time and send them off to Africa and get our good karma or whatever. They're like, uh, no, you know what? Maybe not. Money better. So it, it just all fell apart. So the end result is basically nothing. Um, but there was this push for this weird sort of colonizing West Africa as a place to uh, put freed blacks. And there were a number of southern slave owners who were willing to free their slaves if they could just like send them overseas so they wouldn't be around anymore because like, well, we can't be racist if they're not here for us to be racist at. Anyway, this is the Newport African Union Society, or at least the building it started in. Free Africa Society under Richard Allen. Hey, we remember him. You should remember him. Here's a certificate for the Colonization Society. Uh, I don't think I'd want that in my house. Member for life of the American Colonization Society. Yeah, that's, uh, that's real good. All right, let's talk about how awful uh, D.C. was. Or as it was called to begin with, Washington City. Uh, so this was the new capital after they had Philadelphia for a little while, then they went to New York for a little while, and then they went back to Philadelphia for a little while. And when they were trying to uh, put together the Constitution, for Virginia to allow it to happen, they moved the capital to this weird middle ground between Virginia and Maryland, which is right on the Potomac River, and it's gross. It's this awful place. Um, so it's largely built by enslaved men because, of course, They did hire on uh, freed blacks as well, so some people were paid, but they were largely working the same jobs as slaves. Uh, there was Benjamin Banneker. Uh, he was a self-taught African-American clockmaker, astronomer, surveyor, uh, and assisted the surveyor Major Andrew Elcott uh, to plot uh, the area. So he, he was one of the major figures in setting the ground for what will become at least the central area of DC. They hadn't quite gotten to urban sprawl yet. The, the plague of urban sprawl. Uh, Irish immigrants were there as well uh, because, you know, Irish immigrants were basically barely a step above slaves at this time. Um, and since slave labor was there, they basically had to pay them almost nothing because like, hey, we can pay you a tiny bit or we can just get more slaves and not pay them anything. So take what you take what you can get or leave. And regardless of race and enslavement status, uh, everyone there was facing very poor housing, very little food, uh, not much in terms of medical care because, you know, 1800s, 
and lots of malaria because as I've said multiple times this area is a swamp and if you're in a swamp you've got mosquitoes and if you've got mosquitoes in the 1800s you've got malaria really until like the 1950s if you've got a swamp you've got malaria until we DDT the hell out of the place um, so despite this being a symbol for a new nation, most of the people that helped build it were from Europe. Uh, we have Pierre Lafont, obviously he's French, uh, helped lay out the streets. Uh, James Hoban, he's Irish, he uh, designed the executive mansion. William Thornton, I think he was English, designed the Capitol building. Uh, Benjamin Latrobe, also English, uh, designed the construction of just kind of the overall design. Um, and despite all of the fairly advanced technology used in the construction, um, as I've mentioned many, many times, this whole area was a damn swamp. And uh, John Adams being the first president to actually use this uh, place as his presidency. Um, and Bill Adams had a bit to say about this. And I'm going to pull up this map real quick. Uh, as I've mentioned, the Potomac River does not flow especially fast. And then you've got this uh, eastern branch as well. So you've just sort of got this swirling morass of water and lots of reedy areas for mosquitoes to, uh, to hang out. And I've got a quote from uh, a number of individuals. Let's see. Ba -ba -ba. The mile long road from the Capitol to the Executive Mansion uh, was filled with tree stumps and was nearly impossible to navigate in a carriage on rainy days when roads were proved impassable. Officials walked or rode horses to work. That November, when Abigail Adams moved into the executive mansion, she complained that the roof leaked, the huge house was hard to heat, and firewood was difficult to obtain. Uh, she, was not only, she was not alone in criticizing the capital city. Although founders considered it an experiment in Republican simplicity, most residents painted Washington in hard tones. New Hampshire representative, don't care about his name, Ebenezer Matroon, Okay. Um, if I wished to punish a culprit, I would send him to do penance in this place, this swamp, this lonesome, dreary swamp, secluded from every delightful or pleasing thing. Others describe the city as a fever-stricken morass. So yeah, yeah, not great. Anyway, here's uh, Charles Lenfant. Here's, this is uh, DC in 1860. I, I guess they're refurnishing the, I guess that's the Capitol building. But I mean, you can see here, even though they've, they've shored up the area next to uh, the river, it's still real gross and, and swampy. Uh, so again, we're going to just skip most of uh, Adams' presidency. It didn't really... We talked about what it accomplished, which was pissing off a lot of people. Um, so going on to Jefferson, um, who, again, being a Democratic Republican, anti-Federalist, uh, his goal was to limit the powers of the federal government. Okay, cool. Let's see how he does that. Um, 
repeal the whiskey tax, let the Alien Sedition Acts expire because those were seen as, you know, real bad things from Adams's presidency, and getting rid of those was a pretty high priority. Uh, Albert Gallatin, lawyer for the Whiskey Rebels, appointed Jefferson Secretary of Treasury to reduce government expenditures. Real interesting that, considering what we're going to talk about Albert Gallatin in the next chapter. Uh, we'll get there next week. Uh, we also had an interesting issue with the Barbary States of North Africa. So when we think about pirates, we think about pirates in the Caribbean. There might be a certain bias towards that, but there was a massive pirate confederation in the uh, Caribbean, as well, not Caribbean, the Mediterranean as well, um, that like had control of most of North Africa, and the U.S. had to pay tribute to them so they wouldn't mess with our uh, shipping vessels. We were literally paying protection money to a pirate kingdom. So Jefferson uh, worked with the Ottoman Empire to attempt to capture Tripoli, which was uh, the capital of this uh, Barbary pirate kingdom. Uh, it failed, but the pirates did at least agree to reduce uh, the payments that we owed them, apparently. Well, I was at another major event happen much closer to home. Uh, the French Revolution had been going on for a few years now, and uh, in Saint Dominique, the slaves of the French uh, rose in rebellion as well. So at first they worked with the French, the British and the Spanish against the French, but then once the British and Spanish just decided they were gonna um, just take over, the freed slaves fought against them. Uh, Toussaint Louverture became president of the new Haiti Republic. Um, however, Napoleon tried to take the island back and uh, Leosha was captured and died in prison. Um, however, due in part to Napoleon's navy being destroyed, um, holding Haiti was basically impossible. So by November of 1803, Haiti uh, became independent and was the first uh, black-led nation in the Americas and the first nation um, created as the result of a slave rebellion, which, let me tell you, uh, terrified the hell out of the southern slave owners because that news started circulating and, uh, and they got real nervous. So uh, here's the Barbary States of North Africa. Again, literally like all of North Africa. Uh, Tripoli over here in what would become Lib Libya. Oh, um, real quick. Um, we talk about like execution by hanging. Uh, when it's done correctly, uh, it's typically the person's already got the noose around their neck and then the platform dropped out from under them so it breaks their neck and kills them instantly. Um, that's the humane way to do it. Um, then there's the less humane way of just like pulling them up by their neck 
while they're very much alive and kicking, literally so, um, and strangling them slowly. And uh, usually when you do that, you do that in large numbers. As you can see with the many, many scaffolds going up the hill there. Also, there's Toussaint Leverture, this fancy hat and really nice sword. Anyway, back to the United States. Um, different since St. James Monroe to France uh, to offer Napoleon two million bucks to use the Mediterranean because, again, um, now the uh, ownership of the western half of the continent was on, in France's hands as opposed to Spain. There was a lot going on there, but don't worry about it. Um, However, while he was there, Napoleon's like, hey, so my navy's gone and we can't really hold that land anymore. How about you give us $15 million and you can have the whole thing. Don't worry about the river, just, just take the whole damn thing. Now, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of the dilemma here. Um, Jefferson is a very strict constitutionalist. If it doesn't say you can do it in the Constitution, you can't do it, period. It's a, it, it's a, a state's issue. Um, so there are no provisions for purchasing land from foreign nations for the federal government, but also like how would individual states purchase land from foreign nations, especially land that would increase the size of the country by more than double. Uh, okay. Um, and also, if he were to go through with this, it would be the federal government using more power than it should have had. So, like, Jefferson was really not for this, but it would increase the size of the United States by more than double, and also it would give the United States a lot of farmland, and that was something that Jefferson was really, really big on, because um, he was, you know, all about agrarian stuff. So, he really struggled about it. Uh, that said, nobody else in the United States struggled about it. Jefferson's like, oh, with a heavy heart, I have, de I have decided to agree to buy the, the land of Louisiana. And everybody's like, yeah, okay, cool, that's great. <laughs> Why'd you hesitate? Um, I'm sure there were a few people like, oh, Jefferson's overstepping his bounds, but they were dumb and bad. Um, yeah, everybody was all in on it. Uh, Jefferson was really the only one who had any qualms. But again, it needs to be noted that like this was totally the opposite of what Jefferson was about. He's famous for making this purchase. He's praised for it because it was a good thing. It's universally a good thing. I mean, well, not for the natives, but for the United States, it was a good thing. Um, and I mean, it was a good thing for France too because they got some spending money because they weren't going to use it. Um, but like Jefferson was the only one that was like, oh, I don't know. So anyway, uh, Congress sent out the Corps of Discovery to map out the new terrain, which of course led by Captain Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, uh, led by Sacagawea. Um, now it wasn't just these three people wandering the entire freaking United States, like. Bilbo Baggins and Gandalf. Um, they had a lot of other natives travel along with them, uh, bring along baggage, horses, food, trade items. But these three were like the ones that were there for the entire trip. 
because they would they would go to like different villages and trade off horses and various members that didn't feel like going the whole way. But there was another member that was there for the entire trip that's often overlooked. Um, a man named York, who was a slave under uh, Clark, who worked as a scout. And once the expedition was done, he was granted his freedom. Now, that said, the book mentions it's not entirely clear if uh, William Clark granted him his freedom because he worked with him during the expedition, or if once they got back to St. Louis, York was like, yeah, I'm getting the hell out of here, and just like ghosted him. Um, but once the expedition was done, York was a free man somehow. Now there's another lesser well-known expedition, but I think it's funny, therefore it's important for our test, because I find it funny. Uh, Lieutenant Zebulon Pike, he's got a cool name. That's a good start. Um, so he led an expedition through the Rocky Mountains, already pretty cool. Those are some big ass mountains if you've never seen them before. Um, I thought I was ready to see them, and then we, we drove to Yellowstone, and I saw the Rocky Mountains. Like, those are unreal. <laughs> the Rocky Mountains are something else. Um, and then he went down into Mexico. Uh, and then he got captured because he was in Mexico, and he wasn't supposed to be. Um, however, because we weren't at any kind of war with Mexico, they were just like, hey, you're in the wrong place. Let's walk you back to the United States. So from um, early 1807, so I guess it'd be like February, March, April-ish, 1807, until July, they were just sort of escorted through Mexico by Mexican troops. Like they weren't in chains or, you know, thrown in prison. They were just hey, you're in the wrong place, let's take you where you need to go. And while they were brought through Mexico, um, the troops just were chatting with them and they found out, hey, the, the Mexican uh, people want to overthrow the Spanish uh, and also they got a really good idea of what would become the Southwestern United States because they were just strolling through the area. Not any kind of, there wasn't really any kind of security. They were just being escorted through. And I find that really amusing because usually when you get caught in the wrong place at this time, somebody's gonna die. But notice was like, hey, you're in the wrong place. Uh, we'll, we'll show you where you need to go. And it was just like a couple of months of just strolling through and Chat and shit. So again, here's the Louisiana Purchase. Again, massive. Orkin country, um, there was some debate about that. Britain still kind of claimed it. Spain still kind of claimed it. We kind of claimed it. I don't know if France kind of claimed it. I think France didn't, wasn't involved there. Yeah, Oregon was, there was a lot of issue there, we'll get to that later. So there's everybody. Look at that fancy canoe, though. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, even their like regular one is is pretty pretty fancy, but like this is just, you know, you know this dude's important. He's got a fancy canoe. He's also got like a bird hat. Anyway, there's Lewis Clark and Sacagawea. Very famous painting. And there's York. Obviously a children's book, but it's the best I could find.
Uh, here's the two journeys of Zebulon Pike. Uh, first, he went up the Mississippi River. Uh, and then he went west to a mountain he named Pike's Peak, because of course he did. Good alliteration there. Um, then it went south along the Rio Grande, got his ass captured, and then they just like walked him through Mexico, told him, hey, we maybe want to do a revolution like you guys did, and then just like brought him through Texas, which was still Mexican territory, and sent him across the river there into Louisiana. I... Again, that just that's amusing to me. I like it very much. My man, my man Zebulon Pike. All right, let's do at least one more. We might be able to get the last one in, but if not, we'll at least do this one. Okay. Talk about the Supreme Court. Um, so there was a lot of stuff going on at the end of Adams' presidency. Uh, with the Judiciary Act, he made six additional circuit courts and 16 new judges. And of course, with these new judges, Adams filled them with people that would um, do what he wanted. So basically, he made the judiciary uh, branch a strong federalist uh, bastion. So James Madison refused to accept these judges and it led to the Maybury, Marbury rather, uh, the Madison court case um, in which the Supreme Court said it could not force executive branch to give commissions uh, but it did have the duty to, to, quote, say what the law was, which, again, is something that we think of just as what the Supreme Court does today, but that's, these are precedents that were created early in the Supreme Court's life. Uh, the next year, the Supreme Court claimed the right to rule on the constitutionality of state laws, which was a big deal because, again, back in the 1800s, um, state law versus federal law was always a big thing. Um, McCullough v. Maryland, there was this loose interpretation of the Constitution's implied powers. Um, federal government had the right to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. This was a, um, a thing with the First National Bank. Again, as we saw with Hamilton, um, and then the Democratic Republicans opposed the first national bank. They chartered the second in 1816. And the reason Maryland's involved is they tried to tax the uh, branches of the national bank, and the court rejected this, saying that the power to tax involves the power to destroy. And then finally, under uh, John Marshall, they established the power of judicial review, which is to say the court could rule on cases involving states and the nation, which again is something we just assume the Supreme Court does, is like if there's any issues between the states and the federal government, it can be brought up to the Supreme Court. John Marshall was... Um, pretty instrumental in creating uh, what the Supreme Court would, would eventually become. Okay, yeah, uh, it says here, Oregon territory claimed by Britain, Spain, and the United States, so I was correct. Anyway, Judiciary Act, new federal judges, control at least one branch. And this is the Maybury decision. Um, constitutional and unconstitutional, we don't scale. And then this 
is the Maryland thing. All right, let's do one more because this is the last in this section and I like finishing with the sections that the book has. So, once again, keep in mind that Jefferson and the Democrat Republicans by extension uh, want to limit the powers of the government. However, if you can see from the title here, uh, they are expanding federal powers. So between 1802 and 1811, the Royal Navy impressed uh, more than 8,000 sailors, which if you don't remember from the last several chapters, that's forcing sailors into service in the Royal Navy, which again, that's England forcing American sailors into service in their Navy. Um, because France and England were at war, because of course they were. So in 1807, the U.S. passed the Embargo Act. Uh, this prohibited U.S. ships from leaving home ports until Britain and France got their shit together, basically, um, to end their own trade restrictions. Now, while this certainly would keep the ships safe, it hurt... Uh, it hurt trade a lot. Uh, shipping was really the only kind of trade they had at the time. You, you know, when you think of shipping today, you think, you think like big trucks and planes and whatnot. The only kind of shipping they had back then was by boat. The only kind of like trade was by boat. So there was some smuggling done through Canada to try and make some amount of money back. So Congress passed the Force Act, which expanded federal power further to stop the smuggling, which, hey, that sure sounds like what was done right at the beginning of the Revolutionary War by, Eng by England, which caused the people in New England to be pissy. So the embargo hurt everybody, farmers, planters, urban workers, and of course sailors and dock workers. So this caused lots of resentment towards Jefferson. Um, the people that were behind Jefferson keeping the federal government from expanding were angry, and then just everybody else because he was threatening the livelihood of everyday Americans uh, with the embargo. And real quick, the perhaps the best image um, that will ever happen this semester. And this is in the book, so I had to find it to show it to you guys. Uh, this is the embargo turtle um, called O oh, Grab Me, which is just embargo spelled backwards, um, biting this guy in the butt. See, it's got the, the embargo license there. Yep. Versus trying to carry barrel goods and curses the snappy turtle oh grab me which is embargo spell backwards yeah it's uh 1800s political cartoons were weird all right see y'all on monday have a good weekend
turn off the slide, didn't I? Oh no, it's still on. Okay. Um, probably not going to pop a discussion today because it's. Uh, we've only had one day this week, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, oh, it is a little bit blurry, isn't it? Well, there's nothing I can do about that right now. Anyway. Yeah, I'll see you guys on Monday, and I'll uh, catch y'all later. Have a good weekend. Uh, bye.